This episode is sponsored by Atomic Mass Games. to episode 40 of the Board Game Geek podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I am so excited to be here today with Meeple Lady, who's a board game blogger, rulebook editor, and a lover of heavy euros and historical games, and also part of the 5 by podcast. How's it going today, Meeple Lady? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. This is, I think this is the first time I've ever recorded a podcast episode in the evening. Oh, yes. Believe it or not. (laughs) So you are very special. (laughs) Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm also a night owl, so this totally worked better with my schedule. (laughs) Cool, cool. Well, I love branching out and trying things new. Speaking of new, uh, I saw on social media that you were attending Circle DC. Uh, yes. Oh my God. It was so fun. This, it happened last weekend. Uh, so Friday, cool. Saturday, and Sunday, um, in Washington, DC. And I hadn't been to DC in a very long time. I think the last time I was there was for a wedding. So it wasn't even to like explore the city. Um, but this gotcha. was like at the Planet Word Museum, which is like in the middle of downtown, in the oh, middle cool. of everything. So it was pretty cool. Um, I came in a day early just to like, explore some sites went to a baseball game nice <laughs> that, nice. that was really fun with um, some some people who went to the con so oh that's uh, with, cool yeah. change of pace <laughs> exactly so just something a little bit different and then um the thing that i love about all these new conventions that are happening like there's sort of like a pre-con meetup so we met up at this like bar that was um you know, hosted by fort circle uh the publisher cool. who is uh, hosting Circle DC, this is their convention, second year in a row. So before gaming got underway on Friday, like we all met up at this bar and there was food and drinks and just chatting and, you know, reconnecting awesome. with people yeah, that you hadn't seen since the last convention or just people you've never met in person. Um, like you've talked to them online and other things. And it's like, oh, it's so good to meet you in person. So that's really fun. I really like when conventions do that. That's awesome. Yeah, we had a great time uh, at uh, San Diego History Con too. Mm-hmm. Similar thing, like the night before it kicked off, there was a, a a little bit of a meetup and that was, yeah, it's a great great way to just kind of like chat with people, catch up, meet people for the first time before you get into the gaming zone. Yeah, that's the first time I met you in person yeah. at the San Diego Hiscon. Yeah, that was so fun. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And yeah, how was the, like, what was the size of Circle DC and like, what was the vibe compared to? Because I've, you know, I've been, I've only been to uh, like GM, GMT's Weekend at the Warehouse in terms of like, historical gaming conventions and also SD HistCon, of course. But I was hoping to try to make it to Circle DC because I'm like, it seems like so cool. And I, like you, have not been to DC in forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, the vibe was pretty similar to SD HistCon. Um, I think Circle DC, I saw on the website, uh, 150 one five zero tickets were sold, but I feel oh. like it was about one hundred and seventy people, maybe. Wow, nice. Um, so it was really intimate. There's a lot happening for like you know you just sort of get to know a lot of the people who attended the convention. The space was great. It felt like, um, what is it? So I, I played a lot more demo games oh. than published games at this convention. So it felt like this is really like a game historical game designer like heaven Uh, people (laughs) are constantly uh working on their prototypes and they have the people to play their games and then they'll take little notes on like how the playthrough went and it was really fun being a part of that you know process for different types of games games that are almost done like you know gonna ship out to fulfillment like soon or Mm -hmm. games that are still in the very very early stages of uh, the design and it's just neat to see 
it felt like everyone, a lot of people were like tinkering with some kind of design, had ideas and all this stuff. And it's just so That's inspirational cool. to be around all this like creative board game historical talent um and that's what i love about these small cons just see what everyone's working on that's cool that's cool um was uh like david thompson there and like uh liz davidson like um like were any other designers that um were like at sd histcon there or any that don't make it out to sd histcon that were there that you met for the first time um yeah there was a lot like liz davidson there david thompson uh dan bullock was there nice um maurice sterling i think i met at sd histcon and he was also there but there was also a lot of um, east coast people like obviously proximity to the convention is gonna you know determine whether or not you make it out like it's so much more expensive to fly across country than to like yeah. fly a couple states over um so getting to know a lot of the east coasters um designers was really great um the big component there is the uh the georgetown wargaming um bunch so yeah people like, yeah yeah like sebastian bay and his whole like conglomerate of like mentees and students and all the things that they're working on um that was wow. really cool like getting to know all those people and so there's like a huge thriving war gaming historical gaming community i feel like dc proper uh jason matthews was there harold buchanan yeah. came out oh uh, nice it was just a lot of fun people and you know you've you've been to sc hiscon so a lot of those similar characters um but also the east coast people Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I hope to make it out there sometime for it because it, it seemed like like when they launched it last year, it seemed like a really cool event. And, you know, it's just like there's so many. I mean, it's a good thing, but it's also a challenging thing because there's so many conventions that pop up and it's it's. You want to go to all of them, but, you, you know, it's just, it's hard. <laughs> no, I hear you. Yeah. Like, this is my first time to Circle DC, so I couldn't make last year's. But, yeah, you got to pick and choose which conventions you go to. That's time off from work. That's money. Um, and just all the other <laughs> yeah. things. Like, you want to enjoy all the things around the convention, too. It's like, do you have time to do that? Like, next year, um, I'm planning to go to Circle DC. I'm probably going to come in even more like even earlier than I did this time just to see all the cool museums that yeah. I wanted to see. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Well, today we're not talking about historical games per se, but we're going to actually be discussing our favorite board games that are based on TV shows. You know, often I find that there are a lot of IP based games that are just pretty terrible you know and they're just trying to just sell it because like oh you like tv show xyz or movie abc you know try this game but sometimes the games are just terrible but there are a lot of really awesome games out there and i know we were originally when we were first chatting about doing this episode we were talking about combining like doing tv shows and movies and uh, I had to change it up because I started making my list and I ended up having so many that I was like, this really needs to be like broken into two episodes. So thank you, Meeple Lady, for being flexible. I know you maybe didn't have as many TV shows as I was kind of like thinking about, but we'll we'll get into our list in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, before we start talking about board games based on TV shows, I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately, Meeple Lady. So let's jump into Fresh Plays. Uh, cool. Uh, so the first game that I want to talk about from Fresh for Fresh Plays uh, was a game I played at Circle DC. It's not quite out yet. I heard it's going to be shipped out soon for cool. fulfillment. Okay. Um, Arcs by Cole Worley um, and Leader Games. Nice. So I got a chance to play that at Circle DC, taught by Cole himself, which was excellent. You know, it's really also just kind of like these conventions. You get to learn a lot of these games from the designer themselves because they attended the convention. Yes. So ARCs was the big one and I really, really enjoyed it. I think um, this is probably going to be one of my favorite leader games games. Um, yeah. I was very surprised how much I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it, it's it's really funny because um, on episode thirty nine, the last episode with uh, I did with Efka, he also had recently played Arcs, but he played it on TTS. And yeah, it's it's I, and I played it at to tie this all back together. I played it at SD Hiscon, and I really really liked it too. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so now I feel bad because I'm just, like, talking about the same game as your previous episode. Hey, if you're excited <laughs> about it, people want to know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it seemed like it was the most finished copy. I'm not sure exactly what your game had looked like at San Diego HisCon, but um, yeah, I really liked it. Well, for those, uh, it's uh, a space game, a space sci-fi strategy game where you are taking actions based on the cards that you're dealt with. It's almost kind of like a trick-taking game, but it's really you're trying to take initiative so you can play first for the next round. Um, so with your typical space games, there's kind of uh, like battles and taking over people's cities, or I guess destroying cities. And, <laughs> um, and the neat thing about this game is... Uh, you score victory points based on taking, um, declaring your ambition. So there's like these things that you can score victory points on each round, but they won't score unless you take that action to declare your ambition. And sort of everyone competes for those ambitions, and that's how you get victory points for each round. So I really like that aspect where yeah. you think you're like, okay, well, I'm getting the most of this resource. Let me declare this ambition. But then now you're like, Everyone else can see that, oh, we're, we're going to get 50 <laughs> points for that resource. So now you're getting to get like the most or second place. Um, it's just such a neat gameplay. I really like the cards. It sort of forces you to uh, take certain actions um, based on your hand, but also you're also kind of stuck with what you've been dealt with for the round. And right. so um on these different cards from one to seven, like they kind of all have different groupings of actions you can take. So as the person takes the first, uh, the initiative and starts the round, you can either play a higher card than what was played of the same suit, which then will give you two actions or you play like you slough a card down and you only get one action or you can play any card that's non-suited, but you also get one action. So you, it's like you're trying to maximize your turn by playing the right cards in the right order um, based on the suit that was played based on who had initiative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you're also trying to like set yourself up for scoring. Like that was like, I love the way the scoring works in that game because you're right. Like if you're ahead on something, you're like, Ooh, I want to try to declare that so that that's getting scored. But then the minute you do, other people are going to start competing or they're going to see you're doing it from the get go and kind of, you know, maybe declare a different ambition or something. But yeah, yeah I, I, I really liked all the like player interaction and um, that it kind of strips down that like epic space opera experience into something that feels new and it's snappier. Yes, the snappier with the cards um, instead of like, here are all the actions you could do. And then you're just sort of like paralyzed because there's so many things you can do. I feel like with these, um, you know, TI4, like giant space battles, unless you're really familiar with the game, you could just be like, oh, my God, what do I do? And right. Just like turtle <laughs> in the back here and like start building my empire. But this it's like, OK, here's a group of actions you can do. Pick one and then like move about your like, you know, your plan. So, yeah, I really like that. I like the art. Again, it's, you know, all those leader games sort of have like the same uh, look to them because they all have the same right. artists. It's just such a neat experience. And I, I feel like I've only played it once, obviously, at the con. Like, I feel like future games will just be so different. Yeah. And then like the fact that there's the campaign mode, too. It's like that's that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned like this might be your favorite leader game. But I was actually telling my uh, friend Ben Mandelker from the Game Brain podcast that I was like, he has not really found a Cole Worley game that has like resonated with him. And I'm like, I think this might be the one that <laughs> like he'll be like, oh, OK, I get it. You know, mm -hmm. I think of all of them because he's, you know, tried a few and he's like, ah, ah. I'm like, you're crazy. Cole's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. Like, I love, yeah, like, I love the, like, PAX Premier. Like, yeah. that's probably my favorite, his game. But then for Leader, this feels 
just slightly different from all the other stuff that he has designed for Leader. And I just really enjoyed it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So that is ARCs. And uh, I will kick it off with another sci-fi sort of game. Um, I recently played Dune Imperium Uprising for the first time. And I am already like a huge Dune Imperium fan. So I don't know why it took me this long to actually play Uprising. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I've just been on a Dune kick recently, having seen the, the new movie uh, Dune Part 2 twice in the theater so oh, far. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, you just can't get it all. Well, the first one I didn't get to see in the theater ever. Oh. So I was like, I'm going to make up for that and actually go multiple times to see this one in the theater. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad I did. But um, anyway, back to the game, back to the game, not the movie. Go see the movie, <laughs> though. The movie's dope. Oh, the movie's uh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's so, so good. But yeah, the publisher Direwolf sent me a copy of this one. And um, this is designed by Paul Denon, uh, the same designer as Clank. And it came out in just at the tail end of 2023, I believe, or maybe at Essen last year. And unlike the first Dune Imperium, this one plays up to six players. So one to six players. And it's 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 basically a deck building worker placement game that's based on Dune, like all things Dune, elements of characters from the new movies and uh, Frank Herbert's book series. And this is a standalone re-implementation of Dune Imperium. So like if you're getting into Dune nowadays, I think most people would recommend you get Dune Imperium Uprising versus Dune Imperium. But I think... Both are great and like they're different enough that I will probably keep keep them all in the collection for now. But yeah, a la deck building games, everyone's going to start with a similar deck of cards. You're going to have a leader in this game. It'll be one of the key characters from the world of Dune, the Duneiverse. And um, each character has a special ability. And throughout the game, you're going to be like uh, getting new cards for your deck to kind of craft your strategy. But where this game kind of, if you're not familiar with Dune Imperium, like stands out to me is it, there is a combat phase in the game. So some of what you're doing is playing cards to place workers on the board and take actions. But you're also like recruiting troops because there's this um, each round you're going to be competing. Well, maybe not. Maybe you don't compete every round in the conflict. But there's a conflict card that will have like some cool rewards that you can compete over. And also the victory point system in the game is such that the end of the game will trigger once a, any player has 10 or more victory points. So it's a very tight scoring game. Every point matters, like lots of really cool tension, so many hard decisions from the worker placement and hand management. So basically on your turn, you're going to, you'll have a hand of five cards that you start the round with. You'll play a card to place one of your agents onto a space on the board. Um, when you run out of agents, you'll take a reveal turn. And then whatever cards are left in your hand, the bottom part of the cards, because these are like multi-use cards, you'll use that to like buy new cards or increase your combat strength, do other cool things and, um, of course, there are intrigue cards because we got the Benny Gesserit and whatnot. So um, there's lots of, like, spicy interactions in the game. And then there's that whole combat phase. But I think since Dune Imperium has been around a while, a lot of people know about it. I just want to call out some of the highlights of the new version Uprising. Um, I think it has, like, lots of really cool changes. I mean, it's still definitely like feels like if you already know how to play dune imperium like jumping into uprising they even in the rule book they call out like here are the differences with these um little boxes they they keep on the sides of the the rule book so it's easy to just kind of skim through and say okay what's the new stuff i need to learn so there are a couple different action spaces of course the cards are different one of the neat things is everybody's going to want to go for getting their third agent because you feel so restricted only having two workers at the start of the game. 
Um, but one of the neat things in this version, by the way, have you played either version or both versions? Uh, yes, I think I've played both. This Imperium one is the one with the sandworm. Yes. I've been waiting one. for you to say yes. that. Like, I think it's oh, the sandworm I, I, one. I'm building up to the sandworms. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but yeah. But yeah. Mm. Yeah, you played it before? Yes, I have the okay. the base one and I've played this one. And I think that have the game, the one with the airships, that expansion. Rise too? of Ix mm-hmm. with the uh, dreadnoughts. Yes. Yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. That's, that's, that is exactly where I'm at too. I've not, I actually never played the Im- Immortality expansion. Same. For yeah. the regular game yet. I'll, I'll get to it at some point. <laughs> but one of the things that's neat about uh, Uprising is that when you go to recruit your third agent, usually it just costs eight Solari. But in this version, they changed it such that the very first player who does it pays eight and then everybody else after only pays six, which is kind of neat because it's like you want that worker, but you also want to get it cheaper. <laughs> so it's it's a, um, I thought that created a new little dynamic around the table as you're seeing like who's going to do it first and haha, you spent eight and I'm only going to spend six. Um, also related to workers, there's no Mentat worker, which was like kind of like a temporary worker in Viticulture. Instead, now the, the board space allows you to like pull back one of your agents so then you can place them again. Um, seems more efficient. I also like that they improve the high council space. Now that's the space where you pay, you know, a certain amount of money and you put a disc out there. And for the rest of the game, you have two persuasion, which is the money, the currency for buying new cards. Um, I call it a coupon, uh, <laughs> but you have it for the rest of the game. And usually in regular Dune Imperium, it's like after you place your little disc out there, you have no reason to ever go back to that space. But in this version, they gave they have a second effect. So when you go there on future turns, there's something else cool you can do. So I really like that. Now you have spies. Mm-hmm. You have spaces on the board that are spy spaces, and you have a new piece that you can place called spies and when you place a spy spies are like kind of um connected to other action spaces where you place your agents and what happens is if i have a spy somewhere and let's say meeple lady went to a space i really want to go to i could still go there by pulling my spy back and i could place on a space that's already occupied by an opponent's agent or let's say Meeple Lady wasn't there, I can place the uh, agent and and pull back a spy to draw a card, which is neat because you're getting like more options. So the spies were cool. But yes, we all came here for the sandworms. <laughs> <laughs> there are now sandworms. And I love how they included like these like plastic, ugly looking, I mean, ugly in the way that sandworms are just ugly to me, at least yes. they're kind of scary and gross. But then they also have wooden ones, which I don't know if that was in case you run out or just a personal preference. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think I saw the wooden ones. I saw the little uh, 3D printed looking. Yeah, ones. yeah. <laughs> that's that's what we played with anyway. <laughs> but uh, in order to get a sandworm um, into combat to summon a sandworm, you need to first get a maker hook. Like basically, if you've seen the movie to ride a worm you got to have these like hooks so in the game now you have to get a hook or else you're not able to summon them and then they're they kind of function similar to the dreadnoughts in with the rise of x expansion but um they're cooler because you, they help you double your rewards so whatever r- reward you win for the conflict it'll be doubled if you have at least one sandworm with you Now, what comes with that is now there's a shield wall and the shield wall is kind of protecting certain locations. And if there's a a combat at one of those locations, you can't summon a sandworm unless someone breaks the shield wall. And so it's like uh, more choices, more choices. Um, There are also now these battle icons on conflict cards and everybody starts with this objective card. And there's a whole nother way to get victory points. Because if you're able to win the com- the combat, meaning take first place, you keep the card. And when you have two matching icons, flip it over and that's a victory point. So now you're like, you have even different incentives to like join and fight hard on certain battles versus like pulling back on others and being competitive because you don't want your opponent to get that, <laughs> that match sometimes. So you want to like go 
hard. So I really, really liked that the the battle icons. We also played with the contracts module. That's just something you can play with or not. Uh, it didn't add too many rules, and it just made uh, gave you new ways to get some little treats and bonuses throughout the game. You know, if I go to a certain space and harvest three or more spice, I get three Solari or something. You know, you have to get the contract first. And then there are other like intrigue cards that like give you end game scoring for having these contracts completed. Uh, so that was neat. And uh, my friend Tim, who won the game, actually got some bonus points on that. And then the thing I'm very excited about that I haven't tried yet is the six player three versus three mode that I keep hearing is pretty like epic and awesome. I love that it's like a team mode. Um, you have w- on each team, you'll have one person that's a commander. You got Muad'Dib and then the other side is the emperor. And then you play your teammates or allies and they kind of play differently than the people who are the commanders. And I'm really, really, really excited to try this because I just love team games that aren't, you know, necessarily like party games. And I just think that it would be a fun kind of world to explore with the team and having allies and everything. So that's I got to figure out how to get that scheduled because I'm I'm so curious about it. But yeah, overall, like I loved Dune Imperium Uprising. Uh, no surprise, like I love Dune Imperium, you know, and it's it's just. I I think it is uh it's it's definitely like a more there's more going on. I prefer it, I think. Um but but playing the ba- the original Dune Imperium with Rise of Ix is also still amazing and I would be if you were like let's play that tonight I'd be super super pumped to do that. So I think mm-hmm. the next thing I want to try also is to play Rise of Ix with Uprising. Did you play um the dune game with new players because we were wondering for our game like it seems like it would be a challenge for new players to play imperium um if they hadn't played the original base game there's just like uprising uprising sorry uprising yeah like it just seemed like a lot going on if you didn't understand the base game i would say i had one new player but it's uh, my friend who like plays a lot of heavy games. Like he's a big Lacerda fan, so it was you know he picked it up quite easily. I think the decisions were very tough, mm-hmm. but um, I think he was able to just like jump right in and uh, everything clicked. But I definitely would agree that if you just take someone who's kind of even like newer to gaming, this one is uh, you know a lot more complex because you have the the spies to deal with, like the the sandworms, the matching of the icons, like yeah, there's just there's just more going on with this version, which but I like I like a lot of it. But yeah, yeah I, 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 I would I would I would think that like a most most new people who hadn't played regular Dune Imperium first will maybe have some challenges, just depending on your gaming experience. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Um, we had all knew we all knew how to play the base tune, but then we're like, oh, there's a lot going on. But um enjoyed it. And I can see how there's an audience for all the different versions, but they're all great. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you can even if you're if you're wild, you can do stuff with like combining cards from both versions, which I'm like, <laughs> I'm not there yet. I'm yeah. not there yet. But I can see some people who have played this like hundreds of times wanting to kind of explore that like Mm -hmm. mashing up the games but yeah really 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 good um and that is dune imperium uprising what else have you been playing um let's see what else have i been playing the other thing that i've sort of been keeping around in my purse a lot recently rafter five have you heard of that rafter five i feel like i can picture that yeah, it's an oink game? Okay. <laughs> it's an oink game. I've never played it. Yeah, it's it's really neat. First, uh, oink games, are it's a Japanese company that makes really, really small like board games. Um, oink games are all the standard box, like imagine a box the size of your palm, but like two to three inches high. And so all the games have all these little components and they fit into this little box. Uh, Rafter 5 is uh, you're trying to get these rafters, which are like all these like different shaped meeples. Um, 
off this raft that's floating in the middle of the ocean. This is the theme. <laughs> but basically, you take the two box ends, put them on top of each other, and then put the little meeples on top of that box. So you have like a little tower. And then there's like these paper planks. Um, and everyone gets a set of treasure chests. So on your turn, you take one of these paper planks, you lift up one of the rafters, you put the paper plank underneath the rafter, uh, the rafter person, and then you put your um, treasure chest on it. And that's ah. your turn. So it's like a dexterity game, Kerplunk version. So as it gets built out, like you got to make a choice of which rafter to pick up one of the five <laughs> meeples because that rafter might be hanging on for dear life for all the pieces and so you're trying to <laughs> yeah you're, it's super fun it's a dexterity game um so if you want to you know you're trying to get all your uh treasure chests on the board there but the board is like you know precariously being built by all these little skinny strips of paper that are like band-aid size you know oh and my you're... gosh <laughs> So it's just fun. It's casual. People are like, oh, my God, this is like, you know, you can see everyone's hands getting sweaty, trying to, like, pick up the little pieces, <laughs> making sure that, and then, you know, I, I actually took it with me to Circle DC just to, like, it's a small game, have it in my purse. And then I just, like, we played, like, like I swear it was, like, two rounds. And then I made a bad mistake and, like, everything came tumbling down. And I'm like, oh, no, this is so bad. But um, yeah, it's really cool. fun. I just love stacking dexterity games. Um, I usually play a lot of Animal Upon Animal um, with, you know, my friends and my friends' kids. You know, it's sort of just like a universal game for everybody. And this is neat because it's smaller. And there's also a little bit of strategy. Uh, strategy. Um, some people will build their plank like in a way that oh that's really gonna fall off but it's not gonna fall off on my turn it's gonna fall off on your turn ah. <laughs> yeah Sounds like some jenga dexterity too exactly <laughs> but it's all paper and you gotta lift up the peoples and the the little treasure chest so it's really fun and it's so tiny you can just like travel with it everywhere you know love the like love a good travel game and also just something you can play with everybody exactly Cool. Not I'm not good at dexterity games per se, but um, but I'll have to try that one. Rafter Five, it's called. Yes, Rafter okay. Five from Oink Games. Cool. Well, next up for me, um, I'm always like big into card games, and I last month went to Flesh and Bloods Pro Tour when they were in LA. Um, not competing, just hanging out, and also to go meet the. Uh, creator of Flesh and Blood and some of their marketing team and everything. And while I was there, um, they hooked me up with a copy of Round the Table. So Flesh and Blood Round the Table is a set of... Well, okay, so just just in case nobody has heard me gush about Flesh and Blood <laughs> before, it is a trading card game that's primarily played 1v1, where each player's playing as a hero and you're you're you go into a fight with another hero and you have weapons and equipment and it's all represented with cards and you know you fight until one of you is knocked out and the the one who's not knocked out wins the game but again it's primarily played there's a big competitive scene very like growing scene for it um and it's primarily played 1v1 and at some point in i don't know in the past few years there's been like there's this version called Ultimate Pit Fight, this format, this multiplayer format of Flesh and Blood that has been like getting some popularity. So they said, hey, like, why don't we make a set of decks that are pre-constructed, ready to play that, you know, somebody could just pick up this box, sit down at the table with three friends and play and so they designed this flesh and blood round the table set to specifically for these decks to be played in the multiplayer format, though you can play it one versus one. But <laughs> I was so curious to play this because I do love the like 1v1 experience of playing flesh and blood, but I also love games where you throw in that like multiplayer mode and then there's like some politicking around the table and everything. And just, I was really curious about like what the dynamic would feel like. And so we played, I played with three other people. I took the hero that's the ninja and uh, Ira. And basically 
every I'll also say like so there are four different heroes um decks in the set and they all have their own like unique play style and everything so I was the ninja and I like my whole deck is based on like doing all these like kind of quick hits and combos like if I've played this I create a crouching tiger and then when I do that, if you know, I do a jump, a flying kick, if it's the third thing that I'm doing. And I have these like kind of uh, pretty low cost cards that I can play to do a lot of back to back hits like a ninja. And meanwhile, then there's uh, uh, my friend Colin was playing uh, Professor Teklavasen who's this like mechanologist hero that like think of the mechanologist class as like steampunk theme. Mm. And they're all about like inventing these different things. So where most of the flesh and blood heroes have like all your, you have all your equipment at the start of the game. This uh, professor has like prototype equipment. And as you play the game, you build out your equipment. And um, that deck had like cards where you could kind of, target multiple here uh yeah multiple opponents i guess i didn't really explain this but when you're playing this multiplayer format you can only attack the players to directly to your right and your left oh okay. so and usually you're attacking just one person with like one action and if you can attack again you could choose to you know target the other person that's on your other side so this this character has ways to kind of like let you target multiple people at once as you kind of like build your gear and everything. And then my partner Matt was playing uh, Melody, the bard. I was really excited to play the bard too. But like when I looked through the deck of cards at first, I was like, how? Like she doesn't have many attack cards. So I was like, how can you even win with her? And it turns out, so she's kind of tricky, like if you've never played this game before, mm -hmm. because you have to kind of, you play these songs, which is giving all of your opponents some benefit because you're listening to my music, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, but as you play songs, you gain this resource uh, called t uh, copper. And then you can do something crazy with when you build up your copper level, um, you can spend it on this... Uh, well, not spend it, uh, <laughs> like metaphorically spend it to then play this big final act song and you could do like powerful attacks with your final act song. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of neat because, again, you have this character that's helping your opponents. And when you're helping your opponents, you're like, hey, I did you a favor. Don't forget that, you know, attack the other person or whatever. <laughs> and, and and speaking of that, the fourth the fourth deck is a guardian deck, a character named Brevant. Brevant, mm -hmm. I don't know. He's a civic protector. He has this like hammer and he's doing like, you know, he's trying to build up this might and do these bigger hits. But his deck has all these chivalry cards Oh. And yeah, it was it was hilarious because my it has like a lot of these chivalry cards. And usually there's a limit of the different types of cards you can have. But his special ability is you can have like unlimited chivalry cards. <laughs> so like off the bat, my friend Richard, like he can basically play these chivalry cards to protect other players. Oh, so this generated a lot of like political talk, like. From the very <laughs> beginning, because he's like, no, I'm going to block that from happening to you. And then you owe me a favor kind of thing. So we had such a great time. And like all these characters like played very differently. And I love the fact that like two of the decks leaned more into this, like you're going to help opponents, but you're getting something out of it. Because mm -hmm. every time Richard played Chivalry, he's getting um, might tokens. And might tokens mean on his next attack, it's like plus one for every might token he has. So he's like incentivized to help, but it's also <laughs> stirring up drama around the table. And like, I got to a point where I was down to one health. Like everybody started with 20, I think. And mm -hmm. I was down to one health and I hung in there and I was second to last, but the um, Colin won as the professor. Uh, but it was a lot of like, I'm going to let you attack that person because if I kill you right now, then that person can attack me. And so just like a lot of really interesting table talk and but like in a fun way, you mm. know, it was it was definitely in a fun way. And um, and my friend Richard's like not somebody who wants to play flesh and blood competitively, but he had a great time 
uh, play. We all did. We we all had a like a really fun time, and I want to kind of explore it more because I think I think there's so many points of variation with you know even if we played the same four people and we switched decks or we switched seats, mm-hmm. even like where we were sitting relative to each other and the order in which you draw cards, like it could have played out like completely differently so i'm kind of excited to see like what these decks you know have to offer like after some more plays and with 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 different people oh that's awesome i love that that table talk that you guys are talking about added that element and that's always fun i love the drama (laughs) yeah yeah there was like seriously there was so much drama just from those chivalry cards initially and it's yeah it, it, it was really fun and like so this is you know, for anybody who's curious to try Flesh and Blood, like this is a good, very casual kind of fun way to get into it. The box itself comes with the four decks and it comes with a one play mat, which you don't need a play mat. You don't need play mats to play the game, but I mean, I prefer play mats. I just mm-hmm. happen to have a bunch. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a nice little upgrade. And then the box itself is, um, it's kind of like in a deck box. So you can use it for storage for that or any other card game if you're a card game collector. But you will need to have some way to track your health. Like there's nothing like included like that. So I just had this like Magic the Gathering app or something that had a life counter and I left my phone in the middle of the table. You could mm-hmm. use pen and paper too, um, or dice, or however you want to do it. But um, definitely worth chips. mentioning that. Yeah, <laughs> poker chips, exactly. Um, but yeah, that you'll. There's no like threat dial or anything like that included. Mm-hmm. Um, but the decks are fun. The decks are fun. So um, yeah, so that is flesh and blood round the table. Have you ever gotten into like any card games like Magic or I or have not. LCGs? Okay. No, I've actually had this conversation at Circle DC. It's just like, oh, I feel like there's a whole – in game design, I feel like a lot of people were inspired by, like, magic, order operations, just sort of just having that dynamic from all those, like, card games. And I was like, oh, man, I feel like I missed out on a whole, like, gaming subculture. But yeah. I also <gasps> don't want to jump into another side hobby. <laughs> I I feel that. I definitely feel that. Yeah, you and I have very similar, you know, with you liking heavy Euro games and historical games, we have very um, similar tastes. So maybe I'll get you into some card games at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I know what you mean. Like, it's, it's, it, I have so many passions within the gaming, uh, you know, umbrella, and it's, Hard to balance them all. <laughs> exactly. There's never any time to do everything you want to do. <laughs> yep, yep. So that was Flesh and Blood Round the Table. And now a word from our sponsor. Iconic characters from across the galaxy clash in Star Wars Shatterpoint, a hobby miniature skirmish game from Atomic Mass Games. Collect, assemble, and paint your favorite characters and pit them against one another in tense duels to control key battlefield objectives. With the Star Wars Shatterpoint core set, choose to lead the forces of light with Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano, or take a darker path with the deadly assassin Asajj Ventress and ruthless Lord Maul. Or perhaps you will forge a path of your own. The choice is yours. Beyond the core set in the Clone Wars, players can recruit characters originating from across their favorite errors from the Star Wars canon via expansion squads, creating dynamic showdowns and mind-blowing team-ups with characters like Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, and even Ewoks. Preview rules, characters, and more on the Atomic Mass Games website and visit your local game store to pick up your own Star Wars Shatterpoint core set and leap into a galaxy far, far away. Let's just dive on into our like board games based on TV shows here. I know you probably had a maybe had a harder time making your list than I did. Yeah, um, you had asked me, well, you know, once you realize that the list will probably going to be too long, you had asked me, oh, do you want to do TV shows or movies, you know, uh, to break up the list? And I was like, oh, definitely like TV shows. And then I probably like after two days, I'm like, oh, I probably (laughs) should (laughs) have 
thing. And, but then I was like in DC and I was sort of just like, you know, thinking about my head, making a short list and stuff. And I was like, it's okay. I'll find some stuff to talk about. But there are a lot of games based on TV shows, like you said, like just sort of like, let's throw out an IP and they're sometimes good, sometimes not. I don't know. I haven't played a lot of them. There you know? are so, yeah. I mean, there are like, there are a ton that I haven't played, but I think like, you know, as we go through my list, uh, of course, I'm going to be biased towards my own list, but I think the ones I have played that I love are like really, really good. So, um, so that's good to know that there are, you know, even though I haven't tried them all either, there's some good ones out there. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's jump right in. So you, you can kick things off with the, your number five. Okay. Number five. Probably not for this podcast, or I don't know, just for in our hobby, but it doesn't matter. Uh, so it's Clue, Golden Girls. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Which I have played with my, you know, friends, like, you know, um, casual gamers. Uh, it's great. Who doesn't love Golden Girls? Thank you for being a friend, right? <laughs> <laughs> How does it even work? It's pretty similar to Clue, just in general. Like Clue is a classic old game, For sure. and I I still like it. I like the murder mystery, the puzzle. You know, it, it is a roll and move ultimately, but you are trying to deduce all the different things, like who was killed in which you know which room and uh, with which weapon. Blanche, uh, exactly. <laughs> so in this one, it's uh, you're trying to solve the crime of who ate the cheesecake. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What they left at the scene of the crime and which room they did it in. So, you know, you're trying to find out who ate the cheesecake. Uh, um, so the cool items that are left behind, they're little like metal pieces. It's the whipped cream, the bathrobe, Sophia's purse, <laughs> lipstick, a recliner, and a feathered slipper. Okay. <laughs> love it so you know golden girls is late Brilliant. 80s early 90s so it's that miami style that's what the game looks like the the different rooms on the board are dorothy's bedroom the kitchen blanche's bedroom the garage rose's bedroom the bathroom and sophia's bedroom and then the six suspects are dorothy blanche sophia rose stan and miles and <laughs> So, you know, it's it's kitschy, it's fun, it has elements, you know, it's a clue, but just re-skinned. Yeah, and and yeah there, are a lot of, was, there are a lot of Golden Girls fans out exactly. there. Sorry to interrupt, that's what I was just thinking about. So, <laughs> I feel like I've seen the box cover of this, unless there's another Golden Girls game. No, I'm pretty sure this might, I think this is the only one. Um, but yeah, like, I've played it with casual gamers, it's fun, just, you know, trying to figure out who did what, and you're still you know, trying to figure out the crime, the cheesecake. <laughs> <gasps> golden so, Clue Golden Girls. Yep. All right. All right. Well, <laughs> I have a different kind of crime that I'm going to introduce here with my number five, <laughs> a much darker show. Um, I'm, my number five is Narcos, the board game. Uh, this is a 2018 release designed by Phil Barros and Renato Silva Sasdeli. It's published by Simon and it plays with two to five players. It's a hidden movement kind of game based on the crime drama series Narcos, which mm. is on Netflix. Uh, and I've seen this show. I think I le I at least watched the first season. I don't know how many there were. Um, Pedro but, Pascal, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, one player is uh, Pablo Escobar, and you're you're the person who's trying to like stay hidden, and your goal is to uh, either complete three objectives or to get twenty glory points to win the game. While the other players, so it could be if you play this two players, one person would play all of these factions, um, if I recall, and then if not you would have uh, each player, each of the other four players would play one of these different hunter factions. Like there's the DEA, the Colombian police, the Cali cartel, and then this other like guerrilla extremist group. And for the hunter side, so everybody's kind of like working together, even though you take your own actions 
and whatnot, um, you're trying to catch Pablo twice. So you need to catch him, and then he goes off again, and you have to catch him again, and you can win the game. And basically, you know, I played a half a game of Fury of Dracula before. Okay. I played Sniper Elite. I haven't played like a ton of hidden movement games. I guess technically Star Wars Rebellion is sort of oh, a yeah. hidden movement game. <laughs> um but like uh but in this one uh Pablo whoever's the Pablo player is going to be playing cards to activate their different like they have all these different Sicario figures which are like his minions and each of those figures has a range value so when you like activate them and deploy them somewhere on the board you know uh, maybe i play one person of course i don't know any of the characters names offhand but if i i have to put it within four spaces of wherever pablo is so i'm giving the other the hunter uh players like some data when whenever i'm activating my sicario figures so you're placing you're playing cards to activate these different figures and um, the kind of things you're doing is you can like put control tokens. So the board is like kind of a map. It has a bunch of different cities. There's some airports. There's some farmlands where you can place cocaine labs. Yes, I said <laughs> cocaine labs and there are little white cubes in this game. So it's probably not appropriate for young kids or some people's taste, but it's thematic mm-hmm. and you're trying to like basically get these figures to get the cocaine to airports. And if they're there at the end of the round without the hunters taking them down, you're going to be getting the labs are generating more income and like shipping kind of trafficking. The cocaine is giving you money and you know, you're using money to do other things like take actions. And then each Sicario member has these, like these armor tokens. They look like, like bulletproof vests sort of. Oh. And so the hunters don't know necessarily the strength of them unless they there's a certain action you can take to kind of flip these tokens over. So there's like a bluffing aspect with the way that the Pablo player can um, put those down. But you're trying to get your your people out and keep them out because they'll generate glory points for you. And you're also just trying to stay hidden from the hunters. And then the other people, you have this like you have this uh, this like kind of like small card market of these action cards, these action value cards. And then you have these spaces, these action spaces that are sort of like worker placement spaces where you place these action cards. And uh, like one of the things you can do is like different investigations, like ask the Pablo player, are you in the same region as my character? Are you in a city or farmland space? You know, you're trying to deduce where is Pablo? Um, you can destroy labs. You can place blockades or get rid of their control tokens to kind of like allow you to move on the board better. You can attack uh, Sicarios that are in adjacent spaces. And you can, you know, once you kind of deduce where Pablo is, you can try to capture Pablo. I've played this once like a couple years ago, maybe in like uh, 2020, I think it was. Okay. And um, I was just I was really impressed with how like thematic it felt and just I think it does the hidden movement. And I, I've only played it with two players, but I hear like from what I've seen and heard from other people, like the playing with more players, like there's more interesting like conversations around the table, like because you're openly discussing strategy you're making the Pablo player sweat more probably. <laughs> Um, but, it, you know, I'm sure it takes longer to play with more people because it's like more people making decisions. Um, but it worked great with two players. And, um, yeah, I thought it was just a really great hidden movement game. And for, you know, considering I watched the show, I thought it was like really thematic, the the way the game worked. Oh, so, cool. I got to yeah. check that out. That seems so fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you if you like that either that theme or just um or the show, it's it's really good. And I I'll also say that like every game on my list, I don't think you need to have seen the show to enjoy the game. Like I think they're like they stand on their own as like great games, whether you you know, know the mm-hmm. show or not. But I think definitely knowing the show makes it better, a better experience. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so that's Narcos the board game. What's next on your list? Okay, uh, number four on my list is 
Jarl, the Vikings tile laying game. Um, this was released oh. in 2015 uh, by Catalyst Game Labs, and it's a two player. It's basically a reskin of the Duke, if you're familiar with that game. No, um, I'm not. It's basically like a two player. Uh, you're trying to capture their Jarl, which is a Norse or Danish chief. Whereas the Duke, you're trying to capture the Duke. So you have a little uh, checkerboard board. Um, and then you have these chunky, like acrylic tiles that you draw from the bag and you mm. place them on the board. And on the tile themselves, it'll tell you how that tile can move and attack or whatever. So it's printed on the tile. Um, so when you take your turn and you take that action and move that specific tile, however it can within the, you know, what's printed on there. The tile flips over, which then gives you a different set of actions, um, oh. what you can do. So you're going back and forth. Um, you're either just sort of like um, moving, capturing, defense, uh, jumping. Uh, these are all the actions. And it's nice because as you draw things from a bag and, you know, each player has their own bag, which their own set of tiles and own set of actions, um, then you're trying to capture their Jarl. So um, that is Jarl. Um, it's from the show Vikings. I've never actually seen the show Vikings. My husband likes to joke that. How come it's right up your alley? Because they have really good beards in the show. <laughs> <laughs> and I like beards. And I'm like, oh, one day I'll add that to my to watch list. But, um, Vikings. Cool. Uh, yeah, but it's a cool two piece strategic. It's like a puzzle and, you know, uh, like a chess like game. Yeah, I was going to say, as you were describing it, it sounds like a really cool, like, abstract strategy game. Mm -hmm. Cool. And it's great to play outside because the the pieces are really, you know, acrylic and thick, and they're not going to fly away, you know, just like you're playing chess nice. out in the park. <laughs> nice. That's good to know. Good to have those games that you can play outside, mm -hmm. especially for someone like me who's Go, yeah, like I go, you know, I have nice weather, fortunate enough to have really nice weather a lot in L.A., and... So it's nice to play outside when yeah, stuff isn't blowing all around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Cool. My next game is Sons of Anarchy, Men of Mayhem. Ooh. Another, here, here we go with another crime kind of game. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my partner, Matt, drives a motorcycle and got into... I want to say like when this show was on, I don't know when it first started, if we caught it two seasons in or what but it was something where i was like i'm not watching this dumb show and then i would just be on the couch while he was watching it and then i got <laughs> hooked like it only took like two or three episodes and i was like hooked Sucked in, in. <laughs> yeah and for me like the show is like still to this day i think one of the most like dramatic dramas i've ever seen where it was like so many moments like it felt real and I'm like oh my god you know I didn't know a show could make me feel this way but anyway so so at some point I picked up Sons of Anarchy because we watched the show and the motorcycle connection and then mm -hmm. it just like it was sitting in the garage for a while but I had heard whisperings on the internet BGG that people <laughs> were like this is actually a really good game that like you know not a lot of people talk about so uh we finally played it like this was like late last year. Um, oh, wow. So this is, yeah, for the first time. Like I've had this for a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's a 2014 release designed by Aaron Dill, John Kovleski, and Sean Swigert. And it's uh, published by Gale Force 9. And it plays with three to four players. <laughs> and on the box, the tagline is a game of money, guns, and violent consequences. <laughs> mm, sounds like Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So this is another one where it's like if, you know, the theme might not be appropriate for younger children and uh, just to some people's liking. But um it's very, very well integrated. Like each player is going to take a role of one of the rival gangs from the movie. And you're basically kind of like trying to control different locations so that you can exploit them and take actions there. And the goal, your goal is to have the most money for your gang um, at the end of six rounds. So everybody has like a player screen because you're keeping your money and your resources which are contraband uh, with these little duffel bags. 
and um, guns your and your money, you're keeping it secret, but you'll also have a player board that has like uh, all of the actions summarized really nicely. So it's a player aid too. And you also keep track of your heat level. Uh, your heat level represents how close you are to getting busted by the police. And um, the you can play the game where everybody plays on the symmetrical side of the player board, or you can flip it over and then everybody has, each gang has a different special ability. And the, the board setup is actually modular. There are these tiles of different locations. So off the bat, you have a lot of replay value because like different tiles are going to pop up, different like locations are going to pop up. They're all like very thematic things. If you've watched the show, if you've never watched the show, but you can just imagine you're a biker gang in this town, like it is very thematic. Um, then you also have these like anarchy cards, which are almost like event cards, but they'll give you sometimes uh, they'll change the rules for the round or they'll give you an, another space you can place your dudes on. Um, in the game, you have motorcycle like uh, members that are on motorcycles like the minis are really cool. And then you also have some that are just standing up. Those are prospects. They got to like train up before they're like full members of your gang. It's another <laughs> thing that's thematic for the game. But you get a certain amount of order tokens. And these order tokens are just like circular cardboard chits that have a flip cell phone on them, which is funny. <laughs> it's like you're calling in an order, you know. But you get a certain amount of them. You get a base amount um, based on your faction. But then you also, for each of your members that you have, you'll get more. And that's how what you'll spend to take actions because you're like calling in these orders. So you can ride and just like move a group of uh, dudes to one space from one space to another. Um, you can, if you are the only gang at a location, you can use that location um, with the exploit action. If you move to a space where there's another gang, there's going to be a conflict, um, which is called throwdown. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to fight. And there's a whole mm -hmm. like blind bidding thing that happens when you throw down. Um, very exciting. But like you can also in this game, you can trade resources. So there are like negotiations to be made like, hey, uh, look, I'll move out of that space if you give me three contraband. Why do we want contraband? Because at the end of the round, there's a um, black market phase where we can sell contraband that we've collected. So a lot of what you're doing is like trading resources, like maybe selling guns to get money to find or trading guns for contraband or whatever. And then at the end of every round, people, every player can, you know, you'll secretly try to sell some contraband. You'll put it in your fist. We'll all simultaneously reveal Depending on the number of contraband that we have total among all players, that will dictate how much money we make per contraband. And then, like, depending on your heat level, you can only even have a certain amount of contraband. So there's all this stuff that's, like, very, very thematic. If in the throwdown, if any of your dudes get injured, they go to the emergency room and you have to, like, go to the hospital and take care of them <laughs> to get them back. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it is so Sons of Anarchy, but like my friends that we played with who don't watch the show still like really enjoyed the game. And I think, um, you know, you have to be down with some like negotiation and like table talk, but, uh, but at its heart, it's kind of like almost like a worker placement war game a little bit. Cause it's <laughs> like, you're, you're competing over these territories, you know, mm -hmm. cause to use certain sp spaces is like really, really powerful. Yeah, it, it's really good. It's really good. So that is Sons of Anarchy, Men of Mayhem. Have you ever watched the show or uh, play the game? I have not for either. But <laughs> now I'm curious about both of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might like it. I think I think more people. Yeah, I think more people like it. And I actually just at my last um, local convention flea market bought a second copy of it just Ooh. because someone was selling it with the two expansions that are extremely hard to get. Okay. So, um, yeah. So I, I think I can't remember if I gave the other copy away or sold it or still have two, but 
Yeah, but now I have the complete set. Mwahahaha. Oh, that's awesome. Vroom, vroom. <laughs> All right. Anyway, moving on to your number three. Okay, my number three is The X-Files Circle of Truth. Uh, it was released in 2018, uh, designed by Stephen Aramini, Danny Devine, Paul Kluka, and it's published by Button Shy and IDW Games. Uh, it's a two-player uh, game. So this is actually a Button Shy game. So they make their games like wallet size, usually yeah. 18 cards. It's literally the size of a wallet. So um, it's just like a bunch of cards, like the rules and a couple extra cards to play with. Um, this originally came out in a in a loot crate subscription box and not through Button Shy. Um, mm. But I didn't hear about it until like way, way later. So I found it on eBay and bought a copy because <laughs> nice. I love the X-Files and I'm like, I had to buy this game and I haven't played any of the other two X-Files games. I'm like, I really should get on that. I actually own the the Upper Deck X-Files Yeah, game. I was going to say they have, they have like a legendary... Legendary, en yeah. Encountered, yeah. And I haven't played it. There are lukewarm reviews on BGG, <laughs> so I just didn't want to dive into that and like be disappointed. So it sits there on my shelf, like, you know. <laughs> looking at me come play but i really like um this circle of truth it's a reskin of button shy's game uh circle the wagons if you're familiar with that uh two players take on the role of fox Mulder and dana scully and each special agent has their own ability the game comes with 18 cards um and each card has like four icons on it which are sitting on different terrains so they have a lot of the familiar icons from the show if you are an x-files show uh the microscope a gun a ufo uh a file uh, aliens and cigarettes for the cigarette smoking man and then um the different terrains are sewer forest mountain field office and lab so with each game, there's only 18 cards um, in the game that are in play. So you shuffle them and then you put them in a circle face up, 15 mm. cards. And then the last three cards are turned or, um, turned over because on the back side is the objectives. So there are these objectives that are um, different for each game. So Wait. what you do on your turn, uh, decide who goes first. And then the player who's second will have to decide where the first player starts in this like circle of cards. Ah. Yeah. So if they pick up that card, that's fine. Then the second player will go. But if the first player decides to grab a card like three spaces over, then the second player will collect all the cards that they had skipped over. Oh. So, yeah. So when you collect on your turn, you... Put them in front of you, in front of your your badge, if, if you're either uh, Mulder or Scully. <laughs> so you're trying to create um, like a, like you put the cards next to, next to each other, like edges, so that the terrains all kind of connect. Um, you want to have the largest uh, continuous space of the same terrain. So it's up to you how you want to lay out your cards in front of you. Um, so it's just a neat puzzle. It's a very quick game. And, um, you know, in the original Circle the Wagon uh, game, they had all the, like, Western icons, like wagons and cows, whatever. And, of course, this one is, like, reskinned for the X-Files stuff. Um, so at the end of – once all the cards are claimed of the 18 cards and you've built out your little tableau in front of you, you score uh, one point per area of your largest, you know, continuous area. And then you score the bonus scoring conditions from the objectives that were at the – uh, laid out in the top of the game. So things like, you know, score X number of points uh, per microscope in your collection. Um, ah, gotcha. Yeah. So that is, what do you call it? X-Files Circle of Truth. <laughs> cool. So so I was really surprised when you said X-Files and then you said button shy. I was like, what? <laughs> I've, ne I've never heard of this game. I, I think I have heard of the, the wagon game you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, when you so when I take a card, I'm kind of like building a tableau. So if I put a card next to it, I can't like now put a card in between them. Or or can you kind of 
shift things around as you get cards. I uh, know. As once you place them, that's it. And then okay. you can always put it on top or side, but the edges have to touch. You can't do like one card horizontal, one card parallel. They all sort of have to face the same way. But um, you just make a little tableau of cards in front of you. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, well, are you ready for a much larger game? <laughs> yes. This one cannot fit in a wallet. <laughs> um, and it certainly has a lot more cards than 15 <laughs> that you'll play with. But um, the next game on my list is a Game of Thrones, the board game, second ah. edition. Uh, yeah, this is from 2011, uh, designed by Christian T. Peterson, who's the, you know, the guy who designed uh, the original Twilight Imperium and used to run Fantasy Flight Games. And this is published by Fantasy Flight Games. It plays with three to six players. And in the game, players are taking on the roles of the great houses from Game of Thrones, the books, and the TV series. And you're trying to vie for control of Westeros. Mm -hmm. And your goal is to control seven territories that have castles or strongholds. And if nobody does that, by the end of the 10th round, whoever has the most wins. Mm -hmm. uh, what I love about this game is if you are a fan of Game of Thrones, it's just like so immersive. Like this is not a short game. I think when I played it, like I think it was like five hours or so. Mm -hmm. Lots of uh, alliances, negotiations. It's got this juicy me mechanism that I love in games that like in this planning phase, you're secretly placing order tokens face down wherever you have units on the board to say like what they're going to do. Like if you're going to try to move units or raid or um, if you're trying to play for support where you're going to maybe help somebody else, but everybody puts these tokens face down and like plans their orders and then you flip them up I love this a mechanism in like Battle for Rokugan and Forbidden Stars. And this is the first time I played it when I played Game of Thrones. But you're also like there's all this other thematic stuff like you're collect you're trying to collect these this these power tokens um so that you can bid for influence on three different tracks. You have like an Iron Throne track uh which like basically lets you kind of break ties for everything except battle and then there's like a fiefdom track which you get the 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 sword the special the valerian sword, steel the valerian steel <laughs> yeah and these these components are amazing too it's like a big <laughs> cardboard sword and then there's a king's court track so you're like vying to like be on the top of these tracks you have to kind of work together to deal with wildling attacks it's just this like big epic war game with like lots of negotiation and alliance opportunities. The combat's really cool. People have house cards that you can play. You can call for support from other houses. Um, I remember it being fairly complex. It's been years since I had played it, you know, in, in addition to it being long, but it's just like so thematic and the, the art is gorgeous. And I'm assuming you like it too. <laughs> from the look on your face <laughs> yes well i didn't want to do a spoiler like you know because that was my number two game game oh, of thrones awesome, so we have awesome. the same one awesome yeah. <laughs> so this, go ahead go ahead share oh your no thoughts. i just like i love it i love what you were talking all the things you're talking about like there's negotiation but there's also backstabbing there's a lot of stuff yes. done in secrecy um it is a con game i try to get it you know like uh played at a con because it is not a short game right um and it's just like you said I, I feel like i'm just echoing all the things it's so thematic with the different houses you know i've seen the show so i understand how all these like different factions work what are their motivations and it like sort of you know plays out on screen yeah. like you know it's so hard to get over like when you're um was it the boat people? Right, then, right, yeah. right. Of course, I can't. Greyjoys, maybe. Greyjoys, and <laughs> yeah, know. and so it's just it's neat. And then I've also played with the Mother of Dragons expansion. Have you played uh, with that? I bought it. I haven't played with it yet. Like I bought it immediately after we played it. Oh wow! It's just adds a little chaos because the dragons just sort of swoop into the map in Westeros and then just can like disappear back to where they're from because it's like this whole other area. Amazing. But it's just neat seeing the little purple dragons, like, get on those. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
But it's not short because now you're up to eight players when you have that expansion and it's like a long game, but it's so fun and I love it just as much as you love it, it seems. <laughs> yes, yes. And and I'm like, this is something that I definitely want to try to get back out, mm-hmm. you know, just us talking about it, me re- revisiting it to like remember how some of the things work because I just, I always like, we loved it. We... Um, my friend group that played it, we are the type of people who will get dressed up as like, like, <laughs> we will, yes, we cosplay a little bit for our house and like, kind of like get, get in the zone a little bit, LARPing a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this, yeah, I, like I said, I immediately after I played it, bought the Mother of Dragons expansion and we just never got it back to the table, but love it, love it, love it. The last time I actually played this was SD Hiscon 2022. Like we got oh! on table. Like Dan sort of always just has it with him sometimes because <laughs> he loves it so much too. So we try to get it on table. And that's the first time that I played with the Mother of Dragons expansion. I'm like, what is Ooh, this? I was not that faction. It was hard to play that faction, but it's just a neat, interesting dynamic to bring to the base game. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's Game of Thrones board game second edition. And that was your number two. Yes, that was my number two. I was like, oh, okay, overlap. <laughs> <laughs> I love the timing of it, too. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'll I'll jump to my number two then. Uh, we'll see if this one overlaps. Uh, not as well known or as popular, but maybe you've played it. But it is the Expanse board game. Oh, I have not played it. I did oh. love. I love that show, though. Okay, okay. <laughs> so this is. I think. I think this is the only one on my list where I've never watched the show. Maybe I started. <gasps> I know. I know. Um, maybe I started watching it at some point. But I have played with people who have watched the show and love the show, and so they have like appreciated how thematic certain things are in the game that Mm -hmm. I can't really speak to, but I could just speak to the fact that it's a great game. It came out in 2017. It's designed by Jeff Engelstein Mm -hmm. and it's from WizKids plays with two to four players. And this is a card driven area influence game based on the sci-fi series, the expanse, um, which I guess the expanse has a lot of like, politics in it and intrigue and everything so um the gameplay is card driven a la something like twilight struggle but one of the things that i think like what made me really curious to want to play it initially was someone uh comparing it slightly to pax premiere and you know we we both love pax Mm premiere so i was like oh i want to try this game and i just love like card driven games anyway so each player plays as one of the key factions from the show. Um, like I think the UN forces, the military of Mars, the rebels of the OPA and mm-hmm. the protogen Inc. Okay. Um, maybe that resonates with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the board is a map of the solar system divided into different areas. And they're like, there's the the way the areas are kind of divided is slightly complex. Like there are bands and then there are sectors. And then within that there are like spaces. I don't remember. I just remember there are kind of like layers to the uh, area influence aspect of it. Then there's a card market. So unlike Watergate or Twilight Struggle where it's card driven, you have a hand of cards and you're playing a card on your turn to do something. Mm -hmm. On this, there's a card market. So there's a row of face-up cards on the table or on the board. And on your turn, these are action cards. And so on your turn, you're going to choose one of the action cards. And you can either play it for the action points or you can play it for the event if your faction is has their icon on it. So like there's a like a center band on all the cards that have um some factions you know it just Mm -hmm. depends because this is all like where the thematic stuff comes in that i'm not really sure of yet i will watch this show by the way (laughs) i i am i am curious to watch it. i heard it's like a slow build but it's very good Mm -hmm. so i will watch it it's all done so you can just like plow through however yeah awesome i love that i love (laughs) that so when you so when you choose an action card the the first one is free but then as you go deeper into the card row um, it starts costing com- command control points, mm-hmm. which is victory points. 
So oh. like to get a card that, you know, was most recently flipped um, onto the card market, you have to spend, I think, maybe three of your points, like three of your victory points. So so you have some tough choices there with like what you take, because sometimes there might be an event card on the board that you're like, I can't let someone else do that. Mm -hmm. um, the other neat thing is when you're choosing which card you want to take, the faction icons on it are in a certain order, but the order doesn't matter, I think. So there's an initiative track in the game. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't remember if the factions are seated in a certain or you randomly place them in this initiative order. But let's say I take an action card and my faction's not on there and I'm using it for the action points, which is like ops and war games, you know, like there's an action point value and an event on every card. Then in initiative order, the another player gets the opportunity after I take my action to trigger the event. Oh. And then it's like, if they do, their initiative token goes to the bottom of this initiative track. So then like in the future, when they're eligible to kind of trigger an event, they're at the bottom of the track or it they feels, can pass mm -hmm. like coin. It, yeah, it feels like coin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in that sense, as I was saying it, I was like, yes, that is kind of like coiny. <laughs> um but yeah, so you can like, so if you decide to use the action card that you pick for the action points, you can like basically move fleets on the map, place influence cubes and or build fleets. Like it's kind of very simple what you're doing, but like the strategy of when, where, where you want to move stuff, where you want to place is all depending on scoring, right? Mm -hmm. So seated in the deck, and this is when it gets paxy. Seated in the deck are six scoring cards. Okay. So once a scoring card, the first one shows up on the market, as my turn, I can trigger scoring, right? Okay. If I trigger scoring, I every area on the map is going to score for sure, like a base score value, but I get to secretly decide which area scores bonus points. And then after I secretly decide that, then everybody gets an opportunity. There's a way you can hold an event for later so uh -huh. we could potentially play events. And then we score it up. Plus, after you score the first – after the first three scorings, everybody gets to, like, pick a technology card. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, like – you're able to, like, choose techs and they're kind of related to your faction. So you're, like, kind of customizing your faction as the game progresses. And then after the sixth card is drawn, you do your final scoring, and that's the end of the game. Okay. This game is so – it's awesome. It is so good. But um, it's definitely not 60 minutes, as it says on BGG. <laughs> like, I feel like this game has always taken two to three hours. Um, mm. But it's good. I think you just have to go in with that expectation that this is not a 60-minute game. I, I, I'd be surprised if anybody ever played this game in 60 minutes. Yeah, that seems like it would be a longer game. Because you gotta yeah. look at all the cards and take your actions and then the six yeah. scoring things. It's 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 lots to think about, but I love it. Like I love that initiative system. I love the the way that you spend basically your victory points to go further into the market to trigger a card. I I yeah. And I, I just love like area influence and we were talking about like arcs where you're picking what's scoring, and in this case Somebody is picking what's scoring bonus points and the bonus points, you know, you, you can deduce because like if I pick the outer planets area or whatever it's called to score bonus points for round one, you know, that token is gone. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can start deducing what's going to bonus score later in the game. Um, but the points get higher as the oh. game progresses and yeah, you're just moving, you know, there are rules with uh, placing your area influence cubes, like you might need to have a ship in, in the, the area. So there's like a whole thing of getting your ships to the right places. But yeah, this game is really, really awesome. My main gripe with it is the background art, like the on the board isn't great. It, oh, no. it looks like it looks like they took like a blurry image of like outer space. Oh, and no. Uh, it's just, 
I wish I had a better board for it. Now, I will say there's an expansion, and I got a review copy of this expansion at some point, Doors and Corners, and I haven't mm-hmm. played everything. It's a modular expansion, but um, I remember at least playing once with, there's some like new technology cards you can play with, but there's all sorts of stuff in that expansion that's cool, and it has a different board, but I oh. feel... But I, but I, I hear you there, right? Yeah. But I feel like uh, there are some things I like better about the playing on the expansion board. But then there are other things that I'm like, oh, I don't like that. Like you did that better on the base game board. So oh, you got to pick your battles. Yeah. Yes. So I would like this game to get re-implemented um, because I think a lot of people would like this a lot. Mm-hmm. Again, I don't think you need to know the expanse. I certainly don't. I just like love a great card driven game with area influence and yeah it's 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 really really tense and it's not it's it's not overly complex either it's like fairly simple it's like put some influence out move some ships into place Mm -hmm. you know the tension comes from like playing the players and the strategy and tough decisions of which card to trigger when not wanting, you know, Meeple Lady to have that event. So, like, do I spend command control points to get that? You know. Anyways. Oh, man. That yeah, sounds it's, so fun. It's very, it's very good. Highly recommend it. Um, although, it actually, it might be out of print. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I'm so someone, sorry. I'm someone so has sorry to own it. It's hard to get. <laughs> Play with me. Play yeah, with me. There you go. <laughs> I'll ask you to bring it at the next con that we're yeah, both at. Yeah, <laughs> seriously, remind me. Remind me. <laughs> cool. All right, that is the Expanse board game. All right, what is your number one? Number one. And I apologize ahead of time because this is out of print. but Because <laughs> <laughs> it's you were just talking about it. But if, for people who know me, this is my favorite game of all time. Battlestar Galactica. It's my number one, too. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. And like you said, you don't even need to know the show because when I started playing this game, I never watched a show. And then they're like, you got to watch a show. And then I plowed through all the episodes. I'm like, oh, this is so good. Like, it's, it's so good. So good. It's like the best implementation of a TV show into a board game because you absolutely feel the tension, the paranoia, the suspicions. You know, you're just going around accusing everyone of being weird or Cylon. 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's Go so good. And my favorite. And I wish. Um, I actually own two copies of it, just in case something, something happens. happens. <laughs> <laughs> because it's out of yeah, print, it's so good. and it's so good. And I'm a purist; I'll only play base game with five players. It makes the skill cards like the the economy of the cards like super tight. Um, so for people who haven't played, uh, basically you are all on uh Battlestar Galactica trying to escape from the Cylons. Uh, the thing is, you don't know if you're a human or Cylon. Like you don't know if your teammates are human or Cylon, and you know you get an identity card uh, in the beginning, and you could all be humans. And then halfway through the game, the sleeper phase happens and you might get turned into a Cylon and your objectives are different now and you want to blow up the ship instead of lead the ship to safety, you know. (laughs) So there's just a lot of that. And so with each uh, turn, you you collect your skill cards. You can only have a maximum number of 10 cards in your hand. Some characters have eight. Um, You know, you do stuff on the ship. You repair things or you jump the ship or you look at, you know, try to send a fighter pilot out there to kill the Cylons that are circling the ship in space. Um, And then at the end of that, your turn, you get a crisis uh, crisis check. So a card flips up and then you all may decide to turn in cards to, you know, pass this check. Um, You could hurt the check or you can like help. But you don't know skill because cards, they sh- yeah. the skill cards, yeah, you, you'll shuffle the the cards before they're flipped over. And if you don't pass it, bad things will happen. And bad things always happen. <laughs> <laughs> and then so you'll be suspicious of people. But like the, the cool thing with that skill check for these crisis events is that there's always a, is it one random card, like a fate card 
Or yes. there, yeah, there's like one random card, at least one, I think. I don't remember the two, exact. two from the Destiny deck. Two from the Destiny deck. Yeah. So there, so there could be, you know, the fate cards could screw you up, but like somebody might say, "Oh, I'm putting in, you know, two good cards towards this check," and mm -hmm. and everyone will be like, "Okay, so we should be good, even if the fate." check screws us over and then next thing you know you shuffle those cards and flip them and you found out meeple lady's a cylon i am not a cylon i'm <laughs> never a cylon i don't know why people think that <laughs> but it's so good and i don't know it's just so fun to play it's not a short game but it's not like a long game not like you know game of thrones i feel like yeah three, you can play two, it on three. a weeknight yeah you exactly. can play it on a weeknight so it's just so good. There's so many expansions. There's like the Pegasus and the, um, you know, Exodus. But I, I don't... need the expansions. I know, like, I know you're, you don't need them, but I uh -huh. want them. They're I... also very hard to find. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I highly recommend if you ever play. It's just fun, you know. And then the Cylons might board the ship and that's bad news. And meanwhile, you have all these dials like population, food, morale, and fuel fuel, fuel. Yeah. yeah and you have you to always... make sure they don't drop to zero <laughs> exactly um and then our our running joke in our game is like oh we could just take a morale hit no one's ever been saddened to death we are always <laughs> saddened to death every single time <laughs> and then you like wonder when somebody's like well we could just let it go and you know not win this check yeah and We're just like, gonna lose. You're like, wait a second. Are you a Cylon? Yeah, you're totally a Cylon. <laughs> you you are so <laughs> suspicious of everyone, and I um, again, Matt is well. No, I said Matt's a motorcycle person. Matt is a bigger sci-fi person, oh, uh -huh. and he is the one that said years ago, like, oh, you should watch this show, and I was like, okay, mm -hmm. and then I'm like hooked in i love the soundtrack like the drums and percussion in the soundtrack mm -hmm. so good oh yeah we will just like alley. play it yeah we we will play it all like the the whole time we're playing the game we're playing all of the Battlestar uh galactica <laughs> soundtracks and um yeah it just it, it's just such such a, it's one of my favorite board games it's one mm -hmm. of my favorite board games and it it does it captures the essence of the show so well well yes so well yeah so i'm glad it's both of our number ones <laughs> <laughs> it's so good <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is another one i want to play um again really soon mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it's semi-cooperative hidden roles heck yeah mm -hmm. so i was also like thinking about <laughs> i'm oh well first of all before we jump off battlestar galactica have you did you play Unfathomable? I did. Which was like a re-implementation. Yes. I was everyone said, Oh, this is a more streamlined Battlestar Galactica. And then the two games that I played, they were not. They were just as long. And I couldn't figure <laughs> out like, wait, what? Um, and then it just sort of um it's different. It's a different world. The you know, the Lovecraftian world with like the sea monsters. Um I will always like Battlestar Galactica. Yeah, I was a little underwhelmed mm -hmm. by it. Yeah, there's just something I don't remember if it was like mechanism differences or if it's like the theme. Just something to me is way better about Battlestar Galactica. Mm -hmm. I I only played Unfathomable uh once, but I was like, eh, I'm okay. Yeah, that, okay. I was like, yeah. I think I gave it two turns and I was like, okay, I'm good. I'm going back to the thing. It wasn't yeah. different enough to justify playing that game versus Battlestar yeah. Galactica. And again, if it was supposed to be the more streamlined version, it didn't feel that way. So, ugh. Yeah. But I guess for people who can't get Battlestar Galactica yes. or like don't know anyone, who, you know, who can they can play it with like. It's something. Exactly. Or love that um, mythos, you know. Like yeah, that or world. if you're Cthulhu kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a game called Star Trek Ascendancy that Ooh. I was like really hype about getting. I got it for Christmas. I got it for me for Christmas. I got all this like these upgraded dice for it. I still haven't played it yet. Um, I'm still not a like Star Trek fan. But, you know, maybe I still think there might be one day where I'll get into it. Either way, I still want to play the game because 
it seemed like it was like in the vein of something like Twilight Imperium, but much okay. shorter, like, you know, asymmetric factions building a civilization in space. So I have a whole bunch for that game and I haven't played it yet. So who knows? Maybe that would have made the list. I don't even know if Star Trek Ascendancy is a play on a Star Trek movie or the show. <laughs> I don't think so, or, for my limited knowledge, but okay. yeah. Oh, okay. So that's good. Like, there's other stuff. As I was Googling what shows got turned into board games, I was like, oh, there's a Firefly game. I haven't played oh, that. Oh, yeah. And then there's a Buffy game. I haven't played that. Oh, so there's yeah. a lot of stuff. Oh, and then the one that was seemed really interesting to me, the Die Hard heist uh technically game. that's the movie though right? oh that's true yes <laughs> <laughs> which goes back to our thing of like oh that's a movie yeah they're... but yeah definitely the other two maybe i'll check it out but i think because of what you said the expanse will be the next one i seek out yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's it's really good i think you'll love it and then i also played um after gen con or something i played star trek discovery black alert Oh. And that that was really good. But again, like I don't and people who I played it with who like Star Trek or like knew that version of Star Trek and was like, it's very thematic and it's a team game, which is neat. Oh, that's neat. Um, so, yeah, so I did like that, too. But it's just that these other games um, are like more my jam, the ones mm-hmm. that I picked. But anyways, this this was really fun. I'm glad we had uh, two crossovers that just further validates our uh, opinions (laughs) (laughs) of these awesome games (laughs) yes yes and and awesome awesome board games for um mostly awesome tv shows also and again like the the games that i mentioned like you don't need to know the show to appreciate what it does as a game like they're Mm -hmm. just really 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 good games some of my favorite games actually (laughs) <laughs> same here Battlestar oh. Galactica forever <laughs> <laughs> heck yeah heck yeah well thanks again so much Meeple Lady for like joining and you know having this chat with me I'm glad I've I've had TV shows on the list to talk about for board games for a while so I'm glad to finally have a conversation and it was great to talk to you too because you had things on your list that I have never even heard of and now I want to like check into them a little bit and yeah and i'm again glad that we both had battlestar for number one (laughs) well thanks so much for having me this was so much fun it was so wonderful talking to you talking games and everything else yeah yeah and hopefully we will catch each other at another convention at some point this year um and you're not terribly far from me let me know if you're ever in la (laughs) yeah if you're ever in phoenix hit me up cool cool (laughs) You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at boardgamegeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under Board Game Geek. You can reach us by email at podcast at boardgamegeek.com. Thanks for listening and happy gaming.